Hi, I'm Rick Hofling. At United Airlines, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their lives and their communities. That's why we're proud to support the Make a Difference programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. Oscar Health Insurance. United Airlines. NJM. Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and more. With a focus on safety and financial stability. New Jersey Resources. Wells Fargo. And by NJIT. New Jersey Institute of Technology. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato at the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. One of my favorite old-time authors we have in the house back um, again, James Kaplan, the author of Sinatra, The Chairman. Boy, I'll tell you, this is a great book. And you, uh, Sinatra, the voice, last time around. Frank, the voice, Sinatra, the chairman. <clears throat> yeah. So let me ask you, what makes this one different? It starts in 1954. Yes. He's just won the Academy Award for? He's just won the Academy <clears throat> Award for From Here to Eternity. He plays? Private Maggio. Maggio. Yes. Tell everyone why Maggio, that character, is so significant. Sinatra believed he was Maggio. Sinatra believed he was Maggio. Maggio was, uh, he was from Brooklyn, not Hoboken, but he was a skinny, small Italian-American who was downtrodden. Everybody walked all over him. And in a lot of ways, especially after World War II, when his career went down the tubes, Sinatra felt very downtrodden. So the role was a natural <clears throat> for him. How does winning the Academy Award for From Here to Eternity Maggio, yes. change Frank Sinatra's professional life. It changes everything because before that he was seen as a loser in Hollywood whose career was over. He had a friend, a literary agent named Swifty Lazar and Swifty Lazar said he's a dead man. Swifty Lazar said even Jesus couldn't get resurrected in this town. Well, Sinatra could and he did. From the night he won that Oscar, his career started going straight back uphill instead of downhill. What kind of things happened for him? A big deal was that he had started, even his record company, Columbia, dropped him uh, in, during, his, during his bad years. Right. But he was <clears throat> picked up by a new company, Capitol Records. Columbia to Capitol. Columbia to Capitol. And he was introduced to a great arranger, young mm -hmm. arranger he had never heard of. Is that Nelson Riddle? That is Nelson Riddle. <sighs> and he started making these incredible albums with Nelson Riddle, and between the movie career being reborn and these incredible Capitol albums with Nelson Riddle, it was a career that shot up like a rocket in the 50s. Help me on this. The night that Sinatra wins the Academy Award, does he go home alone? Yes. He goes home alone. He goes home alone. He goes home alone. He had been, don't forget, at this point, this is 1954, he has left his, the mother of his children and his children. He had gone to Big Nancy's house before the Academy Awards. Big Nancy, his wife. Big Nancy is his wife. Is Ava Gardner in Spain? Ava Gardner is overseas. She is taken up with a bullfighter in Spain. That is that bullfighter in Spain. That is that bullfighter okay. in Spain. So Frank has no wife. He stopped by to see his ex-wife, but he can't go yeah. back to her house right. after he wins the Oscar. He's alone. He's walking around Beverly Hills, holding on to the statuette. He sits down on the steps of a church, and he just has to think his yeah. life has changed, but he's got nobody to tell it to. Um, the book also covers politics. Yes. Sinatra and the Kennedys, go. Sinatra met Jack Kennedy at a uh, Democratic fundraiser in L.A. in 1955, <clears throat> and these were two guys who instantly fell in love with each other. Jack Kennedy loved women. He loved beautiful women. He was a married man, but that didn't mean much to him, and in those days, politicians, especially attractive, charismatic politicians, were allowed to do what they wanted without being 
outed by the press. He loved beautiful women. Sinatra was the A number one world source of beautiful women. And he was knocked out by Sinatra's stardom, by his singing. Sinatra was an FDR liberal, died in the wool Democrat. He saw this incredibly charismatic young politician and thought, this guy's going to be president. And so, and, and Sinatra was always attracted to power. And Kennedy had it in spades. So the two were made for each other. Kennedy, the Kennedy chef, Sinatra. Well, this is how it works. In Sinatra's mind. In, in, well, it, it was a shafting, and it was a public humiliation. In March of 1962, Jack Kennedy was going west. Uh, he was going to uh, spend some R&R time at Sinatra's Palm Springs house. And uh, there was probably <laughs> going to be a little bit of uh, 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 naughtiness that would go on there. His brother, Jack Kennedy's brother, Bobby Kennedy, was Attorney General of the United States. And Bobby Kennedy had just been informed by J. Edgar Hoover that the President of the United States had a lady friend, a woman named Judith Campbell. Who had the relationship with Sam Giancana. Who had a relationship with the head of the Chicago mob, Sam, Sam Giancana. Yeah. At the same time, she was having the relationship with Jack Kennedy. Judith Campbell had been introduced to Jack Kennedy by Frank Sinatra, and Bobby Kennedy said to his brother, you may not stay at his house. Is that how he winds up, Kennedy winds up staying at Bing Crosby's Stayed house? Stayed at Bing Crosby's house instead, and that was a huge public humiliation for Sinatra. Sinatra took it all out, never got mad at Jack Kennedy, took it all out on Bobby Kennedy yeah. and on Peter Lawford. Peter Lawford, who was, a, uh, who was an married, in-law to the Kennedy family. Yeah, married to Jack's sister. Um, the Dean Martin thing, I Big theme in the book? Big theme in the book. Close, but not close. Close, but not close. That's I correct. I don't get it. You have, to, you have to look at the psychology of Dean Martin. He was a strange cat. He was a guy who was, he was so gifted. He was incredibly handsome. He was everything that Sinatra wanted to be. He was big. Tall, strong, he had been handsome. a boxer in Cleveland. Could have been a boxer, and, except, and, was, and, and he was tied to the mob. He had mob friends in well, Cleveland. Yes, he did, and they helped him a little bit. But but Dean could sing. He could sing wonderfully, yes. although he always made fun of his own singing. And the most valuable gift that Dean Martin had was he had an incredible sense of humor. Yes, incredible sense. Quick Perfect. timing, a, a, a lightning timing, and Sinatra idolized Dean Martin, and Dean Martin always kept himself at a distance from everybody, even from Frank. He also pulled away at times when he didn't want to party anymore. Yes. As I read in the book. You know, I recently saw Tony Bennett. Uh, my wife and I went to see Tony Bennett at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, 89 years young. Mm. And the way he's introduced <clears throat> is, and you know this, he's introduced with a voice track mm. from Sinatra saying, I want to introduce this young kid. Yes. The guy yes. who's got the greatest voice out there today. Yes. Tony yes. Bennett. Tony Bennett. Go ahead. Amazing singer. Big difference between Sinatra and Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett brought to his singing a quality of joy. You hear joy in hearing Tony Bennett sing. Sinatra never brought joy to his singing. Sinatra was like a walking opera. Everything was dramatic. Tragic? You, uh, tragic to a great degree, although when he's singing songs like You Make Me Feel So Young, I Got the World on a String, Fly Me to the Moon, you hear a great deal of buoyancy and uh, and, uh, and, and positive energy, but not joy. Joy was not something in Sinatra's wheelhouse. Mm. Need to ask you this. By Please. the way, the book is called The Chairman. Ask, Sinatra. Ask me anything. The Chairman. Here's my question. <laughs> Sinatra's 100th birthday. Yes. Right? We celebrate it. December 12th. 100 years from now, James yes. Kaplan, will we still be talking about Frank Sinatra? Absolutely. Because? Will, because of that voice. People are fascinated with Sinatra today, and even young people are fascinated with him because of uh, a combination of the mystique and the voice, that rat pack swagger, right, and the voice. But my contention is that if you had the mystique without the voice, that would fade away over time. If Sometime in the future, 100 years from now, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, some survivors happened to find a Sinatra CD and stuck it in the antique player of the CD and heard that voice and had no idea about the Rat Pack or anything. They heard that amazing voice, a voice like no other. They would know it was an incredible mm -hmm. voice. So 100 years from now, easy, without breaking a sweat. James Kaplan, one of my favorite authors, and uh, you will love him after this. 
Sinatra, the chairman, James Kaplan, Frank, the voice before this. Great stuff. Steve, thank you so thank much. You. Visit us online at steveautobato.org. Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Sinatra means what to you? Well, you know, he's one of the ultimate interpreters. He was an icon for so many reasons, not only because of the way he handled the lyric, but, you know, his incredible vocal control and his swinging. I mean, he was the swingingest singer. Tell folks what that means who may not appreciate it. Well, you know, his sense of time, his feeling of where the beat was, the way he phrased melodies, you know, and just felt rhythm when he sang, the way he sang with the band. You know, it's just so incredibly musical and grooving and beautiful and, and gorgeous. And I learned so much from him, from listening to him, about how to be a better singer in that regard. We're pleased to welcome uh, Charles Granada, Sinatra expert, author, producer, and uh, he's the uh, producer on uh, Sirius XM's Nancy Sinatra week weekly program. Nancy for Frank, which I listen to every week and also tied to the Sinatra wow. and American icon traveling Sinatra exhibit. Yeah, that's right, every weekend I do it. That's great, thanks, that's yeah. good to hear. Oh, I'm not the only one. A lot of people do. I know. I'm amazed at how many people love our show. It's a great thing. You know what I'm curious about? Sinatra just had the 100th birthday. Right. Right? 50 years from now, still playing Frank Sinatra? Absolutely. Because? Because Sinatra bespeaks quality. It's quality songs. It's quality orchestration. It's quality vocalizing. Uh, the whole package is there. I mean, these songs that Sinatra recorded in his 60 plus year career are really what the American songbook is all about. Mm. And even though other people have come and begun to carry the torch, I mean, it really started with Linda Ronstadt in the early 80s doing these great albums with Nelson Riddle, who was Sinatra's greatest foil in the 50s and 60s as an arranger. But you know, it continued. I mean, you know, we have Boz Skaggs and Neil Diamond and Barry Manilow and, of course, now entertainers like Michael Buble and Harry Connick, who have now predicated their whole Michael careers. Michael Feinstein. Well, Michael Feinstein's in a different class. I mean, Michael is really, he is the preeminent. He is, isn't he? Interpreter, yeah, absolutely. By the way, name the exhibit again. It's the Frank Sinatra, it's the Grammy Museum Sinatra exhibit is really what it is. The, what are we looking at right now? Yeah. Well, I mean, here I can see a great photograph of Frank. Is that his bow tie? That's his bow tie. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a great story behind these bow ties. So in the 1940s, Frank Sinatra became known as this romantic crooner. Yeah. And he had this beautiful crop of hair and these big floppy bow ties. So not only was Frank affecting music in a huge way. He was the first teen idol, starts singing these great romantic ballads and becomes this pop culture sensation. But he affects dress and style. Mm. And, and one of the things that was his signature were these great floppy bow ties, which his wife Nancy, Nancy Sinatra Sr., actually made for him. She did. She did. She made his bow ties in the 40s. And Nancy is uh, 98 years old. She still oh, has God. the pattern for the original oh, no. <laughs> bow ties. And as we could see in the exhibit, the family has generously loaned one of the original Sinatra floppy bow ties. So when he made this transition from the bow tie phase to the ultra sophisticated swinging phase mm. in the early 1950s, Everything about him changed. It wasn't just that his voice had deepened and that he was singing these great up-tempo songs with mm. Nelson Riddle and Billy May. It was also the style of dress. And he really, I think, affected fashion from the early 50s right through the 60s, which most young people now would call the Mad Men era. That's right. But that was the time when Frank started wearing the, the tie bar underneath his tie underneath his collar, which was really cool. Or he would loosen his tie and open the top button and it looked just way cool, right? Not Sinatra. 
Uh, it looked good on him. <laughs> well, <laughs> Not on everybody I, I, else. I think but... it looks good on a lot of people. And the other thing is, he started wearing the snap brim hat. I mean, he started wearing it because well, he was losing his hair. Well, the fedora is that but was the that fedoras, what? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there That's you in, go. this is in the exhibit. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, Talk there, about the fedora. It became synonymous with Sinatra and that style. Now, I mean, fedoras had been around for ye for thirty years, mm. but once Frank started to wear his hat tilted, and we started to see pictures of Sinatra in the recording studio and on the film set and out to dinner mm. with his Hollywood pals or with his family, you know, wearing this great snap brim hat, just tilted a little bit. Everybody wanted that look. So, you know, the snap brim hat, you know, the loosened tie, that very carefree, jaunty, sophisticated image matched what he was doing musically and artistically. And it all kind of melded into this what, pop culture. Thing. What cover, sorry for interrupting, Charles, what cover the cover of the Sinatra, I call it the CD, the CD now, has Sinatra, is the Columbia Years, what, what is the, you know the one I'm talking about. It is. Um, it, it's from the Capitol era. It's from the Capitol, I'm sorry, right. the Capitol era. It's that shot. It's that shot, right. Well, in the wee small hours of the morning. That's it. It's such a great album. And, and see, that's, that's the very neat thing, is that Frank not only expressed these feelings mm. of love and loss of love <laughs> loss of love the jubilation and the joy of being in love and looking for love and then the, the the sadness and the tragedy of losing your love but it wasn't just the music and his voice that communicated that it was the the very covers of the album so in the in the That's wee right. small hours you know he's leaning leaning against a lamppost yes. looking down and forlorn and he's got the hat is tilted down on Swing Easy and Songs for Swingin' Lovers, which are these great up-tempo albums, you know? He's looking happy, looking at young lovers, and he's got the hat on. And, and see, th these are just iconic photos of an American treasure, yeah. an American classic. I mean, that, that was the Sinatra that we remember. You know, um, my mom was always obsessed with uh, Ava Gardner. She talked mm -hmm. about Ava Gardner all the time and the relationship that uh, Frank Sinatra had with Ava Gardner and the HBO documentary, The Two-Nighter, Right. Which I know you were sitting there watching as it was happening. With Absolutely. Was millions of others. Did she have his number? You know, very interesting relationship. Um, without knowing Ava, you know, ever getting to meet her, um, I think they were very much alike. Very mercurial personalities and tempers. I think they loved each other but they couldn't be together because they were so much alike. I think he made her, she made him crazy though. She did, she did. I mean, do crazy things. Yes. I mean- th Really th crazy things. Well, there, there, that's true. And there, there is a home called Twin Palms in Palm Springs, <laughs> which is still there yeah. and still has the original bathroom sink where in 1951, Frank cracked a bottle over the sink after a fight with Ava, and the crack in the sink is still there in that bathroom in that house in Palm Springs. It's pretty amazing. Famous fights. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think tempestuous would be a great word to describe the Sinatra-Gardner relationship. You've called Sinatra the, uh, one of the first multimedia talent. Yeah, you know, a lot of the fact that Sinatra had this phenomenal success was due to the fact that he came along at the right moment. So he had this phenomenal talent. He had a brilliant voice, which he learned to hone to perfection. And he also arrived at a moment when we had a confluence of radio and records and film and television. And then as he started to get older, of course he always did nightclub and stage performances, but you know, as he became the elder statesman of pop music, we had the concert arena era where people mm. would sell out a Madison Square <clears throat> Garden. And Frank Sinatra succeeded in all of those mediums. And that really, to me, is a big thing. That's why I love my job is getting to talk to people like you. Thank Thanks, you. Steve. Love you, man. That Thanks. was great. It's great. It's the 100th anniversary of um, the chairman of the board, Frank Sinatra's uh, birthday. And um, Bucky actually, you, ever, you actually worked with Sinatra. Describe what, it was, what he was really like, Frank Sinatra. He was the champ. You know, it's like uh, if you, 
he was like the Bing Crosby of the world, <laughs> Frank Sinatra. What was his personality like, Bucky? Great, great. You know, he had his ups and downs, but uh, we always had a lot of good fun with him. Was he? I played, I played the White House with him. Was he a great, not just performer and singer, did he know music well? He knew it very well. He felt it. He felt it. He knew when it was right. And I got to ask you, was he a true Jersey guy? Yeah. Yeah, Hoboken, right? <laughs> Hi, Steve Adubato here at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in beautiful Newark, New Jersey. This is one-on-one. -on -one. You were just looking at a clip. Um, that was Frank Sinatra, as you well know, a clip called um, The House I Live In. It was a government uh, video that Sinatra did that speaks for itself, and the man I'm about to introduce knows all about this. He's Robert Foster, Executive Director, Hoboken Historical Museum. And why do we have him? Well, because there's a Sinatra exhibit. It's called Frank Sinatra, The Man. The Voice and the Fans, it's going all the way through to July 3rd, 2016. Good to see you, Mr. Foster. Thanks for the opportunity. 100th birthday of Frank Sinatra. What's the deal? I mean, I've, I've been fascinated by Sinatra. You know, my family, weekends wouldn't be complete without Sinatra being played throughout uh, our home. He was an icon for our family, you know. There's controversies as well about him. But what makes Sinatra an enduring figure all these years later? It's a, you know, for each person, it's something different. Uh, I think the people that I meet are similar to your, your, your connection, is that someone introduced them to this music when they're young. And I kind of liken it to almost like, like the food that your mom made. Uh, that that food is almost like comfort food, and that music is comfort food. And it's incredible to meet someone who's 93, 94 years old, and they'll talk about cutting out of school without their parents knowing about it and going to the Paramount in New York. I was just going to say York. the Paramount in New York. Yeah. <laughs> I used and, to hear that from my great aunts. Right. And so you just hear their stories, and you realize that Frank Sinatra, to them, is like the best spiritual leader, the best politician, like a leader. What's the exhibit? The exhibit is called The Man, The Voice, and The Fans. What do people see? And Good question. I mean, we, we're hitting all three areas. We go over his career, and so there are media stations that are chronological. And so you start with Major Bo's Amateur Hour. That's the way Frank was discovered, kind of a star search program of the day. It's a three-minute piece. Uh, and then we also show how Frank is honored today. Every year, the city of Hoboken, through cultural affairs, has a Sinatra Idol event. Sounds a little corny, but these are the people who are keeping the music alive. So we kind of show the early years, and right. we're showing how he's honored today. There's an interesting connection between Sinatra and Hoboken. Yeah, I mean... Because Dolly and Marty, his sure. parents. Yeah, I mean, Frank Sinatra is growing up in the 1930s, and if you are Italian, not just Hoboken, but if you're you know, Italian in this country in the 1930s, chances are you're first generation immigrant, you're at the low end of the social strata, and you are discriminated against. Dolly and Marty were. Yeah, definitely. And uh, in that clip, The House I Live In, it kind of deals with discrimination. That's right, it does. And generally, we're talking about discrimination about from between Italians and Irish. They're the ones that are going after it. It's not until those two groups start intermarrying and right. getting together for Thanksgiving that things change. Sinatra also a, just a, not just a compelling voice, and he wins the Academy Award in 1954, I believe. Here to eternity. Here to eternity, um, playing Maggio, changing right. his life, right? Sure. Because he was down, I mean, in mm -hmm. the 50s, early 50s. He yeah. couldn't get work. Sure. Performing nowhere other than in the mob joints that uh, would, uh, frankly, employ him. It's, that's just a fact, mm -hmm. right? Do you, in fact, in any way talk about the connection that Sinatra allegedly had with organized crime figures? We actually don't. By um, design? Yeah. Uh, not really. I mean, we just didn't want to focus on that. Is it not important? I don't, 
you know, I, again, our exhibit focuses on so much about the fans' love of Sinatra. We have different memory books around the museum where people, when they come in, they want to tell their story. So you brought we a memory have, book. Yeah. So people um, write about their connection. Correct. To Sinatra. But we, he was, he would have been 100, so who the heck is writing about him? We have people coming in who are three generations. They're bringing in the 90-year-old Bobby Soxer. <laughs> They're bringing in the, you know, the next generation all the way down to the nine-year-old. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. I mean, it is nostalgia, but the fact that they can share all through this music one person. So we're not as concerned with, shall we say, his early arrests. You'll right. see that mugshot, right. you know, a la Sopranos. Yes. Uh, we don't have that on display. This is an exhibit that really honors him. It celebrates more than, his life? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I wrote a piece for uh, New Jersey Monthly Magazine, which will be, a, uh, you can Google it and it'll come up. Uh, on Sinatra on his 100th birthday, and I talked to different people, and one of them was Joe Piscopo, who uh, performed Sinatra, and, and it was one of the few performers that Sinatra thought it was okay for him to do him. Sure. And he tells his own story, which I repeat in the, uh, the article. But what's so fascinating about it is I asked Piscopo whether he thought Sinatra would be celebrated 150, 200 years from now. He said, absolutely no doubt. What do you say? Definitely. Definitely? Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Because? Just because well, who's music, be around? <laughs> his music will be around. Uh, the man made over 50 films. Those films play continually. Uh, and so I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Uh, we have we have 12 year olds and 14 year olds coming in who know about Sinatra from granddad. They're passing it on. The music passes around, passes through. I grew up as a kid hearing that Sinatra used to get bread from my neighborhood, my neighborhood. At, from Giordano's. Right. You hear, you told me something else. You brought bread. Yeah, I'll, this is a similar story, but I've seen the canceled checks from Dom's Bakery. From Dom's, oh, this is, this is, uh, beautiful this is called, this you don't know, this is in my neighborhood called a Panel. Sinatra would order this. Yes. This is after he moved out of Hoboken, uh, and he's getting this in the 1980s. I've seen canceled checks from Dom's. He would have it FedExed out to Palm Springs. And uh, this is bread you got to eat quick. And again, another way to connect to Frank is through food. And of course, he's giving us a, the music. Sinatra, great, great stuff. Thank you. Thanks so much. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Barnabas Health, Oscar Health Insurance. United Airlines, NJM, New Jersey Resources, Wells Fargo, and by NJIT. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.